Hi, Pastor Adam here, and we are in the month of February, the year 2022. This month, we're switching our focus from our covenantal families to our biological families. Remember, this year is about solidarity, so we're going to be talking about what it means to have solidarity, what it means to have unity in our biological families, the standard and metric from where we get that from, where we derive that from. Do we have unity as a family just because we're family, or is there something bigger that we attach to? If you're interested in that, and you... <laughs> Reset! <laughs> Reset, okay? Do I just go? Yeah, maybe do okay. a... Maybe do a what? Maybe do like a... So I can see in the video. Hi, Pastor Adam here, and we are in the month of February, the year 2022. This month we're switching our focus from our covenantal families to our biological families. Remember that we are talking about solidarity this year, and so we're going to be analyzing what it means to have solidarity in our biological families, what it means to be united in our biological families. Are we unified because we're family, or is there something bigger that we attach ourselves to? If that sounds like something you might be interested in, then this is the sermon for you. All right, so... As James alluded to last month, this month we are going to be shifting our focus from talking about the covenantal family that God adopts all of us who come to Christ into. We're going to be shifting our focus from that covenantal family, and this month we're going to be talking about the biological family. And of course, we are going to be talking about that through the backdrop of the year in solidarity. And before I continue, I'm probably going to interchange the word solidarity with unity as I see fit throughout the year. Just be warned, I'm talking about the same thing when I say solidarity and when I say unity. They're synonymous, and I will do that. So um, don't think I'm talking about something different. How do we stay unified in our individual family units? That's what this month is going to be about. And I won't waste a lot of time you know, leading into that because I know today is that first Sunday, so that means we're busy. We have, like I said, communion, we have cell groups, we have man prayer and a full group of men that need to make their rounds in that, and that takes time, and we, uh, you know, have our limits as people. So, let's jump right in. Uh, and what better place to start as we jump into this month on family, what better place to start than the headship of the family units? A husband and a father and how a husband and a father profoundly affect the solidarity of their family. They have a specific task that they're charged with by God, that they must endeavor to keep that solidarity, that unity, so that their family, so that they are following exactly what God wants the family to follow, which is Him. And this task is, is hard work. But it's a responsibility that's unique to men, to fathers and husbands, to the men of our church um, that, as I said, has been given to us by God. An author from the 70s who's writing about, you know, manhood, biblical manhood, what it means to be a man, says, A failure in the home is a man's greatest failure. He may have made notable contributions in his work in science, in industry, in government, but what can atone for a failure in his home, and I don't think he was trying to rhyme, it's just a coincidence, but what can atone for a failure in his home? Solidarity in the family has a positive effect, has a profound effect and influence on the church, just as solidarity in the church has a profound and positive effect and influence on the family. There's reciprocity there. And so it stands to reason that a neglect of this mission, this, this task that we're charged with in our families, um, this lack of solidarity or disunity would have a negative effect, would have a negative consequence as to what God would otherwise intend for us. Spiritual unity in our families and in our church is a dedication to the truths of who God is and what his word says, the life and work of his son and a following of his spirit, which should give us, or which should guide us, sorry. Commitment to the truths of those things are what should guide us as we seek 
spiritual solidarity. And it's a knowledge of all these things, and it's a put all these things that often starts, or it should start, first within the family unit. And it's further informed and supported through the church, through the body of Christ. The unity of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul makes mention of, for example, in Ephesians 4 a few times, is the union between Christ and his saints by which the same Spirit dwells in them, dwells in both of them. Those who have the same righteous character and goals have unity of the Spirit, as Paul talks about. And this means that there's unity, solidarity, between us and those that come before us because we're joined together under the same head, Christ. And we have the same Spirit dwelling in us. We have the same graces of faith, the same graces of hope and love, and that those things are rooted, grounded in the same doctrines of Christ and who he is. And we bear the same mutual affection and commitment to those things, to those shared understandings. But oftentimes, you know, this, this sounds good, but we don't, we don't apply it to the families, or we forget to bring it to the families, or we don't start it with the families. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit uh, in terms of our families. But it's absolutely applicable. And within this lies some extreme importance for how a family is led and by who a family is led. A father has to understand the man, we place a lot of emphasis on the man. Scripture places a lot of emphasis on the role of the man. A father must understand the right application of these truths, of the knowledge of all these things. He must apply those things so that his family stay unified. He must apply those righteous standards of who God is, of what his word says, of the, who his son is and what he accomplished, of the spirit that leads him. He promotes solidarity, he promotes unity by imitating those things, by imitating who Christ is in his life with all the hope and with all the confidence that this will properly influence the family. And that's a controversial truth, statement, whatever position of today. It's a controversial position of today where truth is to be explored freely by the children, you know, disconnected from the wife. The family can freely explore whatever truths they think or desire or commit themselves to. So it's a controversial position to hold today that the head of the household is to bring his family in solidarity to who God is, to recognizing the truths of God. Because of the fact that solidarity is central to our identities and central to anybody, it's important that we understand the true nature of solidarity. The right idea of it is essential. There's a solidarity in the body of Christ, whether we are aware of it or not, one of, as I said, the spirit that we're united in. We have to be clear as to the character that we're following and the nature of this unity. Many people don't understand the, the concepts that we're talking about um, and the application of it, um, or they adopt wrong concepts of what that means in their lives, and so they take, it takes them into wrong directions. And they waste their time in unity in a false unity, a, new, a unity that they're trying to form within their families and within their churches. And I say wasted because it's built on something faulty, a false truth, a false idea of what solidarity means. Their solidarity, their version of it, their unity, is just another false god that they follow. The principle of solidarity, the secular principle of solidarity for solidarity's sake, must never be placed first because unity is not something in and of itself that we, that we let guide us, okay? Unity is an outworking of what guides us. It's the result of something else. I think it was my cell group 
Yes, it was. I think it was my cell group that talked about that or just briefly touched on it in one of James' first sermons, maybe the second week or something. The notion that family sticks together for family, you know, like family above all else. Kind of reminds me of the Vin Diesel memes. Right? Nothing gets in between me and family. And you say it with the Vin Diesel voice if you're doing it right. Okay? Sounds nice. Right? Sounds like a a good ideal and it, it tickles our ears, you know? Family above all else. Family. But why? Why? Why family if it's outside of a proper context and who God is and what he wants for us and who guides us? Why family? That's the secular position. Family is, is what are the, what, blood is thick, I don't know, whatever the, whatever the metaphors you want to use that have to do with family being the strongest entity that we can um, lean on in our lives, in the world. I don't find, I personally don't find any lasting meaning in that. It's empty, right? It's a box too small. It's a box too small for how we understand unity and solidarity if it's outside of God. And this is where I, this is why, I think it was me that was talking about this specifically in my cell group, why you see families fall apart. Why you see families that are estranged or why you see families that at most they say happy birthday on the appropriate day and it's kind of it. Because nothing was ever really grounding that family. Nothing of substance was ever leading that family. There was no real unity, you know? It was just the fact that I'm growing up under the same households, you know? We were born of the same parents, if we're lucky. That's seems to be outmoded these days. We were born of the same parents, and we grow up and spend a lot of time together, but that's about it, because the family was never brought up how it was supposed to be brought up, united under the right person for the right reasons. And so families become estranged and split, and you might see them on Christmas or on Thanksgiving, and that's about it. One month, you know, one start with unity just because, with poor support, with a poor foundation. We begin with the nature and character of Christ, his church, and then see from this that solidarity is inevitable. It's an outworking of commitment to those things. Okay, so if you're going to hold on to something today, hold on to solidarity and unity in the family if it's done right. It's an outworking of a common commitment to God. By seeing the righteousness, by seeing the holiness and purity of the church, we can have solidarity. <clears throat> by understanding this, then we know we can't demand it. can't demand unity. In a family, a father can't try to unify his family by making demands that they be unified. Well, he can, but it won't mean anything. And that was my point. It's ultimately a worthless command. You guys watch Yellowstone? Yeah. Okay. How's that working out for John Dutton at the dinner table? When he's always the only one there and he wonders, why the heck won't my family join me at dinner? His whole goal, his whole ideal is trying to preserve the family, but it's missing a key ingredient. So, you know, if you know, you know that reference. It ain't working out for him. And it's sad. It's a sad thing, especially when it's Kevin Costner and he looks like a sad old man sitting at the dinner table. You know, you feel for him. (laughs) He just looks kind of pathetic and your heart goes out to him because you get what he's trying to do, but short-sighted, you know. It's, it's, It's solidarity for the sake of the family, but not for the sake of God. And so it doesn't work out. Proper solidarity is founded on godly principles and characteristics perfectly demonstrated in the Godhead, in Christ, in the indwelling of the Spirit, in who God is. And they're foundational in regards to this year's focus on how we understand solidarity and all the different ways it plays out in our family and the specific relationships in our family, fathers, fathers, fathers to sons and, and uh, husbands to wives and, and sons and daughters to their parents and in the church and so on. Proper 
focus, understanding, perspective, commitment, foundation, you, whatever word you want to use, is the key to understanding this year. So with that in mind, then what is, what is it that dictates solidarity that we're striving for in our families? So I have a few points, specific points of importance to keep in mind today. The first is that we acknowledge with full conviction and belief that God is who he is. That sounds obvious, maybe. A full conviction and acknowledgement that God is who he is. In John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, The Father and I are one. This sort of profound, if not shocking, statement that Christ makes, right? This would have been blasphemous for the Pharisees to hear, for example. The statement that Jesus makes doesn't have to do with an organ, organizational structure within the Trinity. But it's the very character and nature that he's speaking to, of who God is, of who he is. And without allowing this truth, which is going to be the point here, without allowing this truth to abide in us fully, to dwell in us fully, to dictate our lives fully, then there will never be any real unity. There has to be a full commitment to what that statement is. It's the acknowledgement of that obvious statement. That obvious statement of truth which allows us, which allows, sorry, John to rejoice in 2 John chapter 1, verse 3, ver, sorry, not chapter, 2 John verse 1 through 3. There's only one chapter. Um, 2 John verse 1 through 3. And he says, I'm writing to the chosen lady, speaking about the church, to the chosen lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. The bridge to solidarity for people is the pursuit of truth. That's the common goal. John is sincerely and truly attached and unified to this family of believers he's speaking to in the church, of truth seekers. And you see it in the way that he writes to them. You see his sincerity. You see his, his unity to them. You see their solidarity because of their commitment to the truth. He loves these people truly, and is unified with them. He's joyful at seeing it so warmly held and guarded and so happily represented in the church, by the church. Those who love the truth itself are pleased with all the effects it produces in individuals and in families. Today, modern Christianity, families, both secular and Christian, place significance on unity more than they do on truth. More important than other things like repentance and overcoming sin and obedience to God's word and to the gifts of salvation and to eternal life and to furthering God's kingdom, they're more interested on being cool with each other, but not having any real idea of what that means or how to accomplish that. And in doing so, they manage to miss the whole point of where solidarity comes from. All the talk is about being together, but for, but for what? For why? Just because? For togetherness sake? As if it's, as I said, a thing to strive for? Throughout Christian denominations we've seen in the last few years, we see unity given priority over truth, and we see doctrines watered down, ignored, or abandoned altogether for the sake of keeping the peace, for the sake of unity, for the sake of acceptance. There's no real guarding or pursuit of the truth anymore. Easier just to let these, these people do their thing and figure out how we can accommodate it. And we see the same thing play out within families. For the sake of unity, for the sake of acceptance, we are willing to abandon the truth or just keep it to ourselves. 
willing to abandon the truth so that someone else can live out their experience. Because that's what's true. Their experience. Their own counterfeit version of truth. Since family sticks together, well, I guess I have to learn to accommodate whatever, insert whatever. I have to learn to accommodate it because family sticks together. Far from guarding actual truth and upholding it in our families, we as a culture promote flagrant and blatant sin and mockery of God, you know, for the sake of staying together. Churches fear upsetting their congregations. Pastors don't want to say inflammatory things, even if they're true, for the sake of ruffling feathers, losing membership, you know, splitting the church. Families fear causing tension and splits in the family. I don't want to go to the Super Bowl party next week and then have to deal with the fallout of that thing I said, even though it was true. Fear of isolation and fear of rejection begins to dictate our lives rather than the pursuit of and protection of truth, which John wrote about and rejoiced in, in his letter to the church. And it's the Father's responsibility specifically to lead and speak the truth in love for his family so that they be properly unified in God. And we can't put a mistaken sense of love because that's what it is when we think we're accept, being accepting or accommodating to someone. We can't put a mistaken idea of love um, before our endeavor to maintain and preserve truth within our families. So the pursuit of truth and who God is has to be at the top. Jesus says in John 15, 9 through 14, I have loved you even my, as my Father has loved me. Remain in my love. And when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And back to 2 John, verse 6. Love means doing what God has commanded us to do. We are called to worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 23. It's impossible to discuss, to expect solidarity in our families or within a group of people who diminish the value of what truth is, which is what we see today. And for the last, I don't know, how many years, Pastor Monty? The abandonment of truth, the diminishing of truth, the, the twisting of truth. Decades, probably, in the making. And you see, it, you see the way it plays out today. You see the effects, the effects of it now. What's true? I don't even know what's true anymore. Whatever you say, well, that's not true. It's the truth of who Jesus is, what he did, what he accomplished through his death, through his defeating of it, through his resurrection, that we can hope to be united to God and with, and with each other. Everything else is just a stopgap. Some sort of answer we try to come up with that doesn't actually last. Short-term solution rather than long. It's the truth that is absolutely necessary for unity and true spiritual solidarity that we hope to accomplish within our families, within our church families. There cannot be true spiritual unity in a family if the members aren't in agreement with the goal, the purpose, the focus of who God is, of what sin is, of how Christ conquered and overcame it, and how it's through him that we can now live righteously in a restored relationship with God. Without the truth, there's no center of reference. There's no righteous standard by which we have solidarity or can expect it whether in a family or a church. So are we doing what we need to do to make sure our families are unified under that umbrella? 
under that hierarchy, under that structure, under that focus and perspective? Or are we replacing Christ with some other counterfeit version of unity? I'm not going into the questions just yet, just asking. Because that's what family does. So I have to replace it with counterfeit. Another point I want to latch on to today is that we have proper relationship with and are a reflection of Christ in our lives. Same author I mentioned earlier writing about that book on manhood from you know, a few decades ago wrote this at, regarding what it, man should be for his family. Our crucial times require men of strong minds, kind hearts, willing hands, men who find joy in labor, men of courage, honor, strong opinions, clear minds, and high goals, men who are not afraid of great responsibility, men who can become dedicated to a task and will surrender their own selfish desire in pursuit to a life of service, men whose word is as good as their bond. But along with this fiber of steel, there must be a gentle nature. We need men who can appreciate a sunset or a sunrise. Men who love their families with passion and honor. Men who adore womanhood, yet dislike weakness or coyness. We need men with compassion, sensitive to the needs of the less fortunate. Men who are tender with their wives and children. Men who are developed, who have developed an ability to love. And that sounds good, all those things. We probably agree with lots of those things, even. It sounds poetic. But this ideal man is only possible from a right relationship with God and understanding who we're called to be. The ideal is, in fact, Christ in us. <clears throat> it's the process of our lining ourselves with his perfect self. And we have a responsibility toward that as men, not just as men, actually, all of us, that's what we're trying to do, right? Live Christ in our lives, reflect that. We have a responsibility to bear much fruit, to live God's way of life and to teach others. If we are fathers, we have a responsibility given to us by God to be a strong example to our wives, to lead and teach our children in this way so that we can come before God unified as a family. You can't expect to make progress to pursuit to produce meaningful fruit if two, three, four, five, six people have different goals for what the family should be. There needs to be a unified pursuit of God to produce good fruit as a family. Third point is 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 that it's the head who acts. So what does that mean? Paul is inspired to reveal the mystery concerning the marriage relationship between husband and wife and how it compares with Christ and his relationship with the church. The head acts by loving, nourishing, and cherishing the body. And he says this in Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 33. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Excuse me. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands, you ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. And as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and their two are united into one. And this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife respects her husband. The qualities necessary in unifying our biological families are ones which obviously draw direct parallels with Christ, which is Paul's point. The unity of the spirit and purpose in a man's family begins with his leadership, which should be clear. Joshua declares plainly and boldly 
to the Israelites, but as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Chapter 24, verse 15 of his book. The members of a family have a responsibility to submit to the authority and vision of its head. It's the head who leads and the body follows, just as it's Christ who leads and we follow. The same spirit and purpose clearly in mind. Yeah, I already said it, but we can't expect to you know, walk together in unison and accomplish anything if we're not united under that head. As a church, as a family, understanding our place in that structure, in that hierarchy, being submissive appropriately, all these things. That's another controversial statement of today, but it's true. The church doesn't act, move, or work separate from Christ, but in submission to him and his will for his body. Our responsibility as his body is to execute his will. This is what we pray for all the time. We pray for things, but we pray that it's in submission to God's will. An overactive church body isn't the sign of a good one if it's not in, in line with the prayer for God's will to be accomplished. And a busy family isn't a good one if it lacks any sort of commitment or service to God. How do we analyze the value of activities? We don't do it by measuring the output of energy by judging the results which it leads to, but by judging the results which it leads to by the fruit which it produces. Does your family, we will know if your family, how about this, we will know if your family has solidarity, is unified under God if it produces fruit for God. Does your family produce fruit collectively as a unit for God? Or is it just this guy that's doing it? Or Maybe it's just the wife that's doing it, or maybe somehow the son picks something up along the way, even the parents aren't doing it. Or is your family working together in unison, in solidarity for God, producing good fruit for him? Are we examining our role in ourselves in that process? And a fourth and final point that I'll transition to then is that our solidarity comes not so much from our challenge to be, to be doing something, but by who we are, but by being something. And that's righteousness. We must be useful to God in the way that we are furthering his kingdom by bringing others to him, to the transformative knowledge and glory of his son. The main hindrance to Christ working in our lives is that we aren't being as useful as we could or we should be. Look at the many figures in Scripture that God used as his greatest witnesses. They were far from perfect men or women. Their first struggle was always the struggle with themselves. Their first struggle was always the struggle with themselves and with their own abilities or inabilities and powers rather than letting God lead them, rather than trusting in God to do what he says he'll do for them. But eventually a point comes when they are you know, brought to their knees before God in submission to him entirely. God's way of life is something that we must genuinely internalize with humility and submit ourselves to him. And so as we lead into communion today, I'll end with this that the supreme example of this, of all that is good and important, is his son. The most useful person to God that ever existed. So as we transition, let's think about these truths. And I'll quote another speaker who said it more eloquently than I would have. There wasn't an area of his life, Christ's life, that was deficient. He never lost sight of his responsibility to complete the work that he was sent to do. He was the ideal 
noble leader of men, women, and children, all the while true to his convictions, even unto his own death. He had the moral convictions to introduce ideals and teachings and standards that were unpopular to those of his day, countercultural to those of his day. He dedicated his life to the service and salvation of others, lifting people to better planes of thought and of living. He was a masculine man, possessing courage, determination, fearlessness, decisive judgment, and assertiveness. He was skilled and masterful in a difficult situation, never afraid to face the hard-heartedness of his enemies. He was strong enough to toss the money changers out of the temple when they were disrespecting his father. He maintained his dedication to his duty until the end when he said, it's finished. His character was spotless, built on the epitome of moral principles and standards of perfection. He was eager and enthusiastic about life, promising, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Yet with all his strength and courage, there was gentleness about him that drew women and children to him, that drew the outcasts of his day to him. Women wept at his feet, and children eagerly surrounded him. With all this, he had humility. Though he was worshipped as perfect, he denied his goodness, saying, There is none good but the Father before me. Yet with this humility, there was a self-dignity about him that commanded respect. As he stood before the judgment of the high courts, he bore his false accusations valiantly and faced the scoffing multitudes with superb dignity. Jesus was the ideal man for solidarity. He was perfect. As we move forward and contemplate the next few weeks of the month, contemplating our family units, our roles as fathers, as husbands, of wives, of brothers and sisters, as children, as mothers, we need to unite in solidarity of this truth of who Christ is, the perfect God who gave much for our own sake. Let's hold on to the truth which actually unites us rather than anything we may try to replace it with, to substitute it with, anything the world would entice us with. It's not the blood that we share with family that unites us. It's the blood that was given by Christ which unites us. So my questions for you guys then are, bear with me, are these. Are there mechanisms you keep in place? Are there things that you do for your family to ensure proper solidarity? Or to put it shortly, how do you stay properly unified? Question two. Is your reason for familial unity rooted in something too small? Has it been in the past? Is it now? Does the danger of that constantly creep up in your mind of the temptation to replace God with something else? Too small. Do you replace unity and solidarity under Christ with a counterfeit unity? Sports, work, through social pressures, the weather, if that's what you stoop to? Do you replace Christ with a counterfeit unity? And then last question, is submission to the proper head a struggle for you? What's preventing you from doing your part in that biblical structure as we think about unity and solidarity? These are the questions for the week.